people wants to talk about, well, how do, how do I go about evangelism? How many of you know that the only, there's only one evangelist listed in the Bible? Is that a shock to you? There's only one man in the Bible that's called an evangelist. There are several that are told to do the work, but there's only one fellow that was called an evangelist. His name was Philip. You remember Philip the evangelist? All right. We're going to go to the 8th chapter of the book of Acts. And we're going to see an evangelist at work. Amen. Acts chapter 8. Now I'll start reading in verse number 26. Acts chapter 8, verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace. How many of you got a self-pronouncing Bible? Do you see three syllables there? That there's not the way you say it in hillbilly. In hillbilly you say that Candace. Okay, so we'll teach them how to pronounce it. Uh, Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Esaias the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Our Heavenly Father, thank you today for the privilege to pray. Lord, thank you for your book that puts glasses on our face that we may be able to see correctly. I pray, our Father, we'd use it as a pattern. Use it as a pattern in how to preach, how to pastor, how to teach our Sunday school lessons, how to do evangelistic work. Pray, our Father, we'd look into your word because there are the oracles of God. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now, Philip is the, uh, the fellow that I spoke of this morning that took a piece of yellow chalk and drew a circle around himself and said, Lord, I want revival in this circle. And he's a one-man revival if you read about him. Now look at verse number 26. That's where we started. It said, The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Now if you've been with us in our Revelation study, you know that Uh, we've discussed angelic manifestations 
their truth and their error. We live in a world that wants to worship anything but God and wants to give credit to anything but God. And if they can uh, have contact with an angel, they'll be satisfied. Uh, And uh, uh, the angel of the Lord did speak to Philip. The last angelic ministry that I can find in the Bible was uh, whenever it the angel of the Lord came and let Peter out of prison. That's the last thing I remember an angel doing. Now, uh, there was an angel that communicated with Paul when he was on the ship, but he didn't do anything, just gave a message. And then, of course, we got all of those angels that appear in the book of Revelation, and they do quite a few things, but they're not in the dispensation of grace. They're in the tribulation hour. I'm going somewhere with this. The ministry of guidance is not committed to angels. The ministry of guidance is committed to the Holy Ghost of God and I'll show that to you. No angel, no angel can compare to having the Holy Ghost of God to be your teacher and your guide. John chapter 16 verse 13. John chapter 16 verse 13. This is Jesus speaking just before he went away. And he said, uh, uh, How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That's his job. That is not an angel's job. Stay with me. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he'll show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Amen. He's not going to glorify anybody but the Lord Jesus Christ. In the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, in the 6th verse, it was not an angel, but it was the Holy Spirit himself that stopped the apostle Paul from going into Asia. You remember that? He forbid them to go into Asia. I said that to say this. Do not major on the messenger. Major on the message that he gave. The Galatian people, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 14, the Galatian people received the apostle Paul as though he were an angel of God. Now, one of the definitions, not the only definition, but one of the definitions of an angel is a messenger. And they received the Apostle Paul as being a messenger from God. If we're going to give it that definition, I'm an angel. Uh Amen. If we're going to give it that definition, anybody that God uses to tell you something about the Lord is a messenger from God. Now, Philip is told to do something. And that something is to step out on faith. Uh, Perhaps... Whenever the Lord communicates, let's go back to to chapter 8. And I want to show you why I made so much of that. Look at at, uh, uh, verse number 26. The angel of the Lord said unto him, Amen. Arise, go toward the south to the way that's Gaza. And he rose and went. The man of Ethiopia, eunuch and all this, was returning to worship. Look at verse number 29. The Spirit. Do you see what I'm getting at here? The Spirit, not the angel. The Spirit saith unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. Now, perhaps what God will teach you in evangelism, and He seems to do this to me all the time, He will make an unreasonable request that the Lord will impress you to do something that you feel there's no point in you doing whatsoever. You're getting ready to get into evangelism whenever you're willing. If the Lord says for you to do that, the Lord impresses you to do that, you're willing to do it. If it makes you look like an idiot. Philip was having revival. And the Lord said, leave the revival and go down in the desert. 
Why would he make such a statement? Why would the Lord say, leave wherever you are and go up Witcher Creek? Amen. God knows what he's doing. God knew where he wanted Philip to go. He knew who he would meet when he got there. He knew the social status of the man that he was going to meet. And he knew the dissatisfaction of that Ethiopian eunuch that was returning from a worship at Jerusalem that had left him dry and empty and ritualism had failed him. And he knew whether he was on his way home or whether he was on his way to disaster and God put somebody between him and disaster and the reason God did that was because that was the man that God would use to win that eunuch to the Lord. You see, God doesn't always use the pastor. Sometimes he wants to use you if you're willing to be an evangelist. Evangelism 101. Uh, God calls, Philip goes. Amen. That's the first lesson we need to know. Uh, God even knew the chapter and verse this old boy was reading. And he said, I want you to go near to him. And, and, and there's, there seems to be a, a, a today, whenever you talk about going so winning or talk about trying to get people, there seems to be a hesitation. We've got churches that are full of Moseses. You remember what Moses said? God said, Moses, I want you to go down there and I want you to deliver the children of Israel. And Moses said, not me. I can't even talk. I mean, if you're going to get somebody, you need a Billy Graham or somebody. You don't need a Moses. If you, Hey man, hey, let me help you. Let me help you, Mr. Uneducated Person. God does not need people's education. God does need, not need people's intelligence. God needs people that are available. God needs people that will say, here am I, Lord, send me. And if we'll do that, God will use us. He will use anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. God will use you if you want to be used. Moses said, I can't go. I'm too dumb. I'm too uh, uh, stubborn. I'm too, uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? I can't talk. I, 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 my speech is the problem. I, I can't talk. The truth of the matter is, we can't do anything without the Lord. Amen. Philip didn't have that Moses syndrome. The Lord said, go. And Philip said, all right, here I go. He wasn't afflicted. Amen. God's angel said, go, and he went. Look at verse number 27. He meets his prospect. Now, I don't know whether you, you country people know about this or not, but all these big uh, uh, salesmanship-oriented churches have got prospect files. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, and, and so in, in, uh, in the glory land, God's got a heavenly file cabinet up there with a prospect file in it. And he said, here's a prospect card. I want you to go near to this eunuch and I want you to uh, 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 join yourself to his chair. Now a prospect is a, a representative of, are you ready? Kandase. Who? Kandase. Kandase is a member, uh, or the, the Ethiopian eunuch is a member of the royal court of the original Wonder Woman. Uh, Kandase was Kenda Kunta Kente. Yeah, she was an African. She was, she was a warrior queen. Uh, if, if you read about her in history, she was a, 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 if you can distinguish the truth from the legend, this old gal, buddy, she meant business, but she had some kind of a connection with that temple in Jerusalem. I don't know whether it was uh, through Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. I don't know whether it was a result of siding with Cleopatra against Caesar, but they had some kind of a connection between that black African and Jerusalem. And she had sent her man up there to worship at the temple. And uh, that effort that's made to, to link them to Judaism is... Do you know it still goes on today? 
Have you ever heard of Operation Moses? Have you ever heard of Operation Solomon? Where they've airlifted all of those black Jews out of Ethiopia and taken them to Israel? I don't know, I don't know whether you've even heard that or not. You need to know that. But what I want to, what I want to get at, and I appreciate Israel taking in anybody that can identify with them, they're taking them in. But I want to say this, and I don't say this to be mean or cruel at all, but I want to tell you that the Ethiopian eunuch, he found Jerusalem to be empty and it couldn't satisfy him. And all of this effort that bringing these people from around the world to set them down in Jerusalem, they're going to find the same empty ritualism. They're going to find the same thing that will not satisfy their soul. Philip finds his prospect and he finds him reading the Bible. Amen. Look at verse 29. The angel is replaced there by the Spirit of God and the Spirit says to Philip, go near and join thyself. And he ran, joined himself. And then he asked him in verse number 30, understand what you read. I think that... uh, uh, This is the make contact point in evangelism. Evangelism 101, led of the Spirit. Amen. God's got to be in it. I'll come back to that in a minute. God's got to be in it. We've got a contact. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. The Bible said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We've got, we've got the prospect file of everybody in the world. And we need to go. But regeneration is brought about by the preaching of the Word of God. Evangelism 101 is not taking place in a formal church setting. But it's taking place where the chariot wheel hits the sand. It's taking place out there in the desert, out there in the real world. And here's what I want to say. You listen to this country preacher. I know I might be a redneck preacher and I know you might be educated and you might know more than me, but you listen to this. There is a world of difference between evangelism and salesmanship. We've got churches that are trying to look at it as a marketplace instead of a hospital. Modern man is selfish and salesmen uh, uh, say we need to be consumer oriented and we need to fix it where they want to buy our product. They got three laws to salesmanship. Law number one, you got to have a product that's marketable. I mean, you can't sell ice cream to Eskimos or snowballs. Then number two, you got to package it in a way that's appealing to people. I mean, you can have a good product, but it's not in a good package. Nobody wants it. Then number three, a salesman's got to have a good sales pitch. Do you? Hey, look. Do you know what? You listen to me just a minute now. I, I, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to do my job as a preacher. Amen. Preaching, evangelism is out on all three cases. What I'm saying is I'm selling a product that they do not want. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are not interested. Amen. If you've ever tried to witness to your family, to your friends... Whenever you get saved, you think everybody in the world ought to be wanting to get saved and they are not interested. You'll go to them with tears in your eyes. They'll laugh at you. They'll say some kind of a stupid atheistic statement. They're not interested. Salesman number one's gone. Our product is not interesting. Number two, the package is not appealing. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2, the Bible said, When we see him, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. <laughs> well, if, that they're, if they're not interested and it's not beautiful, then I've got to be a good salesman. So here I go, door to door, knocking on the door. I am a salesman for heaven. Amen. 
You, 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 that's kind of simplified, but that's what they teach you in Bible college. That's how they teach you to go soul winning. That you, can, that you can go out there and because you are a good salesman, you can change Walmart into a hospital. But you can't do it. I'm telling you, friend, I'm telling you that, that you can't a bit more get people saved by salesmanship to accomplish such an unpopular task with an unpopular product and with a message that seems to be irritating to them, the only way it's going to be done is God in heaven has got to give you some help. And if God doesn't give you no help, you'll never make it. Somebody said, why'd you stay 33 years at Witcher Creek? Because God has helped me. Had God not helped me, amen, I'd have quit a long time ago. But I'm glad that the same God that called me here is sustaining me here and said, you keep on preaching. I'll make it worth your while one day. John chapter 16, verse 8, it is the job of the Holy Spirit. It's not my job. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin, reprove the world of sin, bring a guilty verdict to their soul. You see, they're not guilty as far as they're concerned. You ask the average sinner, the average lost person, and they'll tell you, I'm just as good as the church people. Amen. They may even look at you and say, I'm good as you are. But the truth of the matter is, whenever the Holy Ghost of God gets a hold of them, it's not my brother, and it's not my sister. Amen. It's me, O oh Lord, that's standing in the need of prayer. Whenever he, you remember? Whenever he gets hold of you, amen, it don't matter if the whole world goes to heaven, you're going to hell, and you don't like it. Because the Holy Ghost of God gets a hold of you. He convicts uh, the world and shows them they're a sinner. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. We know that. Not only does it, is it His job to convict them of sin, His job to convict them of righteousness. That is, we've got to have a verdict on who is and who's not. I hear people say something like this, well, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so don't make it to heaven, ain't no need for me to try. Hey, you got a wrong verdict on righteousness. Amen. Brother so-and-so can't live good enough to get to heaven. Amen. Amen. You know, the Bible said the wages of sin is death. Okay, so if a person lives righteous, then death don't have a claim on him. Amen. If, if there was a person to show up that was a really a righteous person, and death was to wrap its old bony fingers around him, I'd have to say that it could not retain its grip. Let's look. The Bible said that Abraham was close enough to be called a friend of God. But death came to Abraham and he never did get up. The Bible said that Moses spake to God face to face. Talked to him just like he knew who he was. But the Bible also said that Moses died. The Bible said that David was a man after God's own heart. Amen. He wasn't carried away with the heart of some, but he, he was a man after God's own heart. And I can honestly say this. My mama was a sweet Christian lady. Amen. Whenever she rocked me, she didn't drop no cigarette ash in my face. Amen. I never saw my mom in a pair of short shorts in her life. Amen. My mom was a good Christian lady. But death wrapped its icy hands around her and she hasn't got up. Maybe your dad. Maybe your pastor. Nobody gets up <laughs> unless they're righteous. And if we've got a righteous person and death does make a claim on him, I mean, we can seal him in a tomb. 
We can put Roman soldiers there to guard it. We can make sure, but I'm telling you, come the third day morning, resurrection Sunday, he's going to kick the bars away and come out of there. But death cannot hold him because Jesus is the righteous, the righteous one. The only righteous one that ever lived is Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost of God convicted me that I'd never make it without Jesus. Thirdly, it convicts us of judgment to come. Acts chapter 17, verse 31, the Bible said that God has appointed a day that He'll judge the world and gave everybody forewarning that He'd judge them because of the resurrection of this man named Jesus. So, a lesson in evangelism. Number one, if the Holy Spirit of God says, I want you to go, then don't send your preacher. Amen. They'll bird dog you. You know what I'm talking about? Go over here, preacher. Go over there, preacher. Go over here, preacher. Go over there, preacher. Hey, they sure need witness too. They sure need witness. I know they do. I know they do. But you see, I know there's a lot of me, but there ain't enough to be everywhere at the same time. But what we can do whenever the Holy Ghost of God convicts our heart like it did Philip's, we can go to and join ourselves. Because we can't do it anyway. It's God that's got to do the work. Amen. Verse number 26, the call, all Christians. Verse number 27, 28, the lost. Any person. The plan. Verse number 28, go. The incomprehension. Look at verse number 30. And Philip ran thither, joined to himself, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, you understand what you're reading? You know What? Now this this is gonna come off as arrogant, but I, but I'm telling you the truth. A lost man reading the Bible is like a seven year old kid in the cockpit of a seven forty seven. They ain't got a clue of what's going on, and you if you're a passenger, you better hope they don't get off the ground. Where you think all the cults come from? Hey, where you think Episcopalians come from? you got lost people trying to understand a book that they cannot understand. Whenever Philip came to him, he said, understand this, what thou readest. He said, I can't. I need somebody to guide me. Well, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to preach God's book to you because I know what Isaiah chapter 53 is all about. If you're a passenger, you better hope they don't get off the ground. Jehovah's Witnesses. Amen. Mormons. Amen. Muslims. Philip talking about about that uh, uh, his daughter-in-law got to go to Houston. I I just saw yesterday they've got 65 mosques in Houston. They're wanting to try to get a, a, a law that whenever the Muslim prayer call comes, that traffic's got to stop yeah. in Houston. They, built, they brought ground. What I was reading, they bought ground next to this pig farm. And they told the pig farmer, said, you better leave because we're going to put up a Muslim mosque. And the farmer said, uh, you uh, don't like pigs, do you? said, no, we don't like pigs. He put a big old sign up, we're having pig races. <laughs> every, ta- every day at prayer time ah, is pig race time. <laughs> Amen. It's his land. Amen. You, you, you feel like he's persecuting them, don't you? I feel like they're trying to persecute us. I'm saying whenever you get a hold of and I, I, this will come off wrong, but every every good thing about any kind of a Mohammedan was learned from a Baptist back in the Middle Ages. Thank you, amen. I had to preach my own preaching here. But what I'm saying is that this man had no clue of who he was talking about. He said, uh, uh, who's this man talking about? Himself or, or somebody else? And Philip began, amen, verse number 35, isn't it? Began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. You'd be surprised how Jesus can come out of the scripture. 
You can get it in Genesis chapter 1. It said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And if you know your Bible, it's talking about Jesus. Same scripture. Tell me the story of Jesus. Amen. Tell me about the stable where he was born. Tell me about how he grew up in obedience to the earthly parents. Tell me about that time he was baptized there in Jordan River and the heavens opened up and God said, this is my beloved son. Tell me about his ministry that he went about healing people everywhere he went, raising the dead. Tell me about the cross where they nailed him and agony and pain and the grave where they lay him. But tell me about resurrection morning. Tell me he lives again. Tell me he's exalted at the right hand of the Father. Tell me that he's coming again to make everything new. Tell me the story of Jesus. That's what evangelism's about. Evangelism is not stories about some lost puppy, but it's about Jesus Christ that died for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. Tell me the story of Jesus. The pardon. Verse number 37, isn't it? Now I'm sorry, if you got one of them NIVs, it's not in there. <laughs> Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ amen. is the Son of God. Amen. If you believe, amen, faith, the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Well, I guess he changed from evangelist to pastor right there. Because he said, hey, uh, you believe it, I'll baptize you. <laughs> and he baptized him. Amen. Then look at verse number 39. Don't forget the rejoicing. Whenever. We, whenever we take that call to evangelism, say, Lord, here I am, use me, send me wherever you want me to go, do whatever you want me to do, that I might be able... Do you know why people are poor? Do you have any idea why people are poor? Is it because God's unable to supply their need? Or is it because God wants you to supply their need? Hello? God wants to give you an opportunity. Amen. You know how people get saved? People get saved by believing the gospel. You know why God, God wants you to give you an opportunity to go tell them, amen. amen, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what evangelism is all about. Philip did a good job. I hope I can do a good job. I hope you can do a good job. Because if we have evangelism, we will have revival. And there's going to be joy in the camp. Rejoicing. And I guess he must have been at least partially raptured. He was caught away. Amen. Went on his way rejoicing. Philip was found at Azotus, what, miles away. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Evangelism, a lesson in evangelism. Now, if I would condense this whole thing, I'd say, number one, the Lord speaks to your heart. The Lord says, I want you to witness to that person. Amen. And you say, well, if you're like Moses, you say, I ain't able. If you're like Philip, say, okay, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Has, has, that, has there ever been embarrassing to you? The Lord say, I want you to do this. And you say, not in the middle of Kmart. Are you crazy? Well, has it ever happened to you? Have you ever? You, you say, the Lord wants you. You know what they told, you know what they told me? at Valley Camp Coal Company, they said, Preacher, you need to leave your religion outside. You don't need to go inside and go witnessing to people. And I said, Well, I could leave it out here, but what if I need it? <laughs> Amen. What well, so, well, slate falls on me? Will you bring it to me? It was just kind of unreasonable for Philip to go to. And I know I said it's quitting. But I feel like preaching, man. It was kind of unreasonable for Philip to go to the desert. 
But God knew there was a man there that needed salvation and he knew that if Philip would obey him that he could use Philip to tell him the story. He did and Philip did and told him the story and the man got saved and I'm sure that when he went back to that African queen I'm sure that he had a brand new story to tell way down yonder in the land of Ethiopia. I've been to Calvary and I've met the Lord Jesus Christ. Evangelism. You can do it. Let's bow for prayer.